produced as part of the Pre-Modern Worlds podcast project at Georgetown University. Today, we start in Florence, Italy, inside a small goldsmith's shop. In this shop are hundreds of small gold medallions that have been carefully molded and turned into beautiful pieces of jewelry. I found myself in this shop while I was in Florence just a few years ago. As I observed the remarkably detailed craftsmanship displayed on each coin, I wondered where this gold may have come from. I left that shop in Florence wearing one of the gold medallions around my neck, and little did I know I would soon learn that the gold was likely sourced from sub-Saharan Africa. As you can see, our world is connected in ways we may not have previously known. So now, we travel back in time, entering the world of medieval Africa where we find ourselves among trade routes. We follow the paths of gold, specifically a set of ancient African coins from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, throughout Western Africa. We start our journey with an overview of the cities along our trade route. We begin in the cities surrounding Lake Chad, cities of Islamic North Africa, and specifically the city of Siljamasa in southeast Morocco. This African city was an important stop along the trade routes of gold, connecting medieval states who were looking to purchase items from the gold trade. From Morocco, we travel south to modern-day Senegal and Mali, adjacent to the Falame and Niger rivers. According to University of Pennsylvania art historian Sarah Garan, this is where the great empires of Ghana and Mali flourished controlling the trade of gold from these sites and making these sub-Saharan cities fabulously wealthy. Professor Garan continues, saying that excavations at the city Dayoub of Senegal, located along the Falame River, have found evidence that there was a thriving community living there, which was the source of gold for both the empires of Ghana and Mali. Now we will hear from Professor Khaled Asesa of the African Studies Program at Georgetown University, who kindly agreed to be interviewed. Let's hear how he describes the types of trading that occurred in these medieval states. This is a time when medieval uh, West Africa was really uh, an important trading powerhouse. Uh, it played a central role in the global economy, a time when merchant and scholars uh, have been crisscrossing the Saharan deserts and a time of exchange of goods, items, um, but also ideas. These empires were the center of trading in medieval Africa and played an active role in exporting goods throughout the world. Furthermore, Ghana and Mali were main contributors to the flow of trade in Western Africa and also served to promote the exchange of ideas among medieval states. The wealth that the gold trade brought to these riverside cities allowed for great control not just over gold, but over other resources such as iron for weapon making and horses for transportation. As we move further down our path into the cities along the Falame River, we see a metalsmith working with small pieces of gold and fashioning them into valuable coinage. These coins, made in the 10th to 14th century, are made of solid gold. Perhaps it's the Sudanese gold, which is known to be some of the finest gold that is incredibly pure. Sudanese gold in particular is very special, being 92% pure while just having 8% impurities. This is in comparison to most gold, which has at least 20% impurity. Because of the remarkable purity of Sudanese gold, many coins in medieval Africa were fashioned from this gold. Perhaps the Florentine coin around my neck is Sudanese gold. This metalsmith works tirelessly to create the coins we're looking at today and pays particular attention to the intricacies seen on our coins, especially the script. We now narrow our focus on the ancient cities of Ghana and Mali. Both of these cities played key roles in trading and were contributors to the spread of the Islamic faith throughout the world, thanks to the help of our very own gold coins, as we will soon see. The size of each coin we are looking at today is much like the size of ordinary coins we use, although much shinier. Each individual coin has a distinctive set of intricate designs that consists of a multitude of geometric shapes, 
specifically circles and squares. But in the center of our coins, we find a form of Arabic writing. The intricacy of each of these designs illustrates the unique characteristics each coin holds. In addition, the intricacies highlight the incredibly high level of craftsmanship that was required to create such an object. Each coin varies slightly in size and shape, some appearing as large as quarters and others as small as dimes, revealing the imperfections that come along with human craftsmanship. Each coin has a slightly different outer circumference, some more oval, some more circular. There's no coin that's a perfect circle. Furthermore, there's no coin that's completely flat, but rather each is slightly raised or indented on certain portions of the coin. There are also a few coins that sport two holes on opposite ends of the circumference, suggesting that these coins may not have only been used for trading and purchasing purposes, but maybe for another purpose as well. Now we focus specifically on the Arabic script. The script may appear strange, as many coins at the time held images of emperors and important figures, not writing. Yet strangely, these coins show no figures, only writing. In the medieval world, Arabic was an important language and was seen as a symbol of economy and independence. Furthermore, Arabic was the language of the Quran, the language of the Prophet Muhammad, the language thought to be spoken in paradise, and even known as the Latin of Africa. By using Arabic script on these coins, also known as seals, Muslims meant to spread the Islamic faith throughout the world without having to explicitly send people to inform others about the faith. These coins did not just remain in Africa, but saw the far reaches of the world, and the Islamic leaders used this to their advantage. Political relations between the provinces in the center of the caliphate, as well as the dynamics of multicentrism, imperial ambition, and the formation of an Islamic empire, also impacted the way the Muslims expressed their rule and ideology in material artifacts such as seals. The exclusive use of the Arabic language by the administration was one example of this, even taking into account accidents of preservation, a pattern of change disseminating from the political center to the periphery with faster implementation in the public domain, in which central control was greater, is visible. We now hear again from Professor Asesa, exploring further into the spread of the Islamic faith in the medieval world. You know, it's very important to understand that Islam spread to North Africa through conquest, but West Africa, Africa south of the Sahara Desert, uh, Islam spread through commerce and through trade. As these coins traveled, people noticed the writing that's scripted on each coin. When people saw the writing, it may have prompted them to ask questions regarding the script. What type of writing is this? What does this script say? Once someone learned it was Arabic writing, they would likely look up the verses in the Quran. This curiosity led to an increase in converts to the Islamic faith and aided in the rapid spread of Islam throughout the medieval world. These coins created by the Islamic empire were a generally new idea for the time. The first instance we see of coins being used for trading purposes is in the Umayyad empire in about the 8th century AD. These first coins are thought to have been produced in Siljamas, Morocco, one of the first cities we examined on our gold trade route. Before the 8th century, coins weren't typically used as a means for payment. The majority of items in medieval times were paid for with objects of equal value. For example, grains or meats may be bought with a type of fruit or vegetable, or pottery may be bought with animals such as cows or sheep. This concept ensured that there was a never-ending supply of necessities in the Islamic Empire and throughout Africa. These systems that were put in place allowed the Islamic Empire to begin their rapid growth, gain a monopoly on certain goods, and finally allowed them to become one of the wealthiest empires in the medieval era. As the Islamic Empire grew, they were able to institute the use of coins due to the fact that they had grown their expanse far enough to ensure that there was enough food and supplies without trading equal objects as a form of payment. We can imagine some of the great wealth Africa had from the traveler Ibn Battuta, who while in Africa, wrote about an experience, saying, The armor bearers come with splendid weapons, quivers of gold and silver, and maces of crystal. Four emirs stand by his head driving off the flies. In their hands they have a silver ornament like a stirrup. Dura the dragoman comes in with his four wives and his concubines, who are about a hundred, in fine clothes. 
On their heads are gold and silver bands with gold and silver apples attached to them. It is clear from this passage that while on his trip, Ibn Battuta saw the vast amount of gold and valuable goods that Africa had to offer. In addition to a monopoly of the gold trade, Africa also controlled the trade of copper and salt. Today, these items may not seem extremely valuable, but in the medieval era, these items were as valuable as gold itself. Mansa Musa, a famous emperor who ruled Timbuktu during its height, was at the center of many of these trades. Through his control of salt, copper, and gold, just to name a few, he was able to become what some call the wealthiest man in history. Timbuktu had a vibrant culture during Mansa Musa's rule and was a thriving city in medieval Africa. Mansa Musa was even depicted in the Catalan Atlas, a medieval map known to be the most important map in the Middle Ages, which further heightened his fame. The wealth that Africa accrued caught the attention of Europe further expanding Africa's reaches among the world, and to think that much of this growth was due to the Arabic script on our coins. Despite being small in size, these medieval coins have uncovered a piece of history we may not have previously known about, revealing connections between ancient states and empires. Perhaps the next time you use a coin, you will think about the places it might have traveled. Our coins illustrate that even small objects, such as these gold coins, can provide great details about history and how the world as we know it today was built.